Hey folks. Michelle, hey, good morning, Virginia. You're up awfully early. Yes. Uh, it, it shall be an interest, a great morning. Yes, and well, we hope so too. Hi, Clara, are you there? Uh, she went to grab a bite to eat. Oh, okay. Bite to eat. What time is it there for? It's the same as. It's to you. It's two, I guess the late two, European probably, lunch. Yes, a late Iberian lunch. Yes, yes. it's uh, the Spaniards. I didn't realize that Portuguese also had lunch this late. But, all right. Hello, Tina. Uh, so she joined us a bit earlier, so I, she, she probably went to get some water and to get ready. So. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, and I know with the Maria, there was, I guess she might be joining just at the cusp of five, at, at six, because, well, the cusp of the two UTC is she had to bring child to the daycare, so. Okay. So, okay. Clara will be back. I just, you know, you said you'd be on as of 745. Hello. Oh. Hello. Oh, here. here. We're all here. Well, I don't know. We're all here yet, but some of us are here. Clara went to have lunch. Okay. Hey, Michelle. Yes. I, I, this is fine. I, I don't know why my, my internet may be a little unstable. I don't know that I have much to say, but uh, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not as important as you guys at all, but glad to have the ability to speak. Oh, wonderful. We have so far 16 attendees. So hopefully, and we are now live streaming. Well, we had some technical glitches, but we're li live streaming to the WCA page. So. Ah, okay. Well, I see 20 participants. What do you see? Oh, uh, well, there are four panelists and 16 okay. attendees. Okay. Speaker gallery. So good morning. Okay. You can see certain things I can't. Because yeah, well, as the as the official host, that uh, I can yeah. have more control. So there's Emily. Hi, Emily. Good morning. Hey, good, good morning. morning. Hi. Good morning for some of us. Yeah. So, right. Michelle is a saint. It's not even 6 a.m. there. Hi, Clara. I back. So um, I gather you were having lunch. <laughs> I'm having coffee because it's early here, but you know that. I had lunch because it's my son's birthday. It's my grand, oh. my father-in-law's birthday. And uh, well, anyway, and I was just starving. So <laughs> beyond all those reasons, I was starving. That's right. But I'm here. I had tested with Michelle before because I was afraid because I was not at home. So I was afraid things would not work out, but it's working out fine. Yeah. You did this last night, right? Or last night? We tried last night and we tried oh. now about half an hour ago as well. Oh, okay. But I'm just worried, uh, Michelle. So only the people who will be in the room will be able to get in, right? No, only the people... The presenters, in a sense, I guess the panelists will have be able to turn on their videos and their microphones. Everybody else can listen and can communicate in the, the chat room. I've okay. I've, been, I've been on uh, on a number of things like this where I can't talk, but uh, you know the presenters can. I don't know what that's called, but yeah. Yeah, the webinar oh, format. They are just the same, but, but I, I will see twenty nine minus five, so that's twenty four, right? Michelle knows. I can't see. Yeah, we have, I guess, the 24 attendees. Okay. Plus the six panels. Okay. But it's still like, we still have five minutes to go or seven, actually. Yes, it's early, seven minutes. It's 7.53 a.m. here. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry, I'm late. Good morning. You're, oh, not, you're, not, you're not late. You're not late. Um, what is the plan? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't actually know what, what you had intended uh, for the so two, two rounds, five minutes each. And it's not, it's not an academic presentation, but more sharing some ideas in a sense, I guess, uh, I did the two rounds and opening up for discussion and questions. Okay. I have, I'm going to improvise this. 
Yeah, oh, right. is fine. Clara, you want to say something? I mean, I don't know. Clara has been running yeah. our WCA. Yeah, don't, don't worry. I, I have uh, I have it all printed. <laughs> so I, I, will, um, I will read the statement from WCAA and I'll read the statement from the Russian colleagues concerning this issue. And I'll present you guys, everyone who's going to be talking. And then I'll give you the words and, and it's gonna, and you know, each one presents about five minutes, the most, we'll have a second round and then we'll discuss, you know, it will be an open discussion based on the chat and I'm counting on Virginia's help for that to, to check on the questions on chat on the chat since not everybody can talk um, in this Zoom webinar, we want to make sure we get all the questions on, on the chat. On the all chat. right, I have a question. Uh, yeah. w wow. Uh, the, the, the World Anthropological Union has also just issued a, well, I don't know if they've issued it, but they have accepted a statement that mm -hmm. you probably can't see, but Michelle no, probably I has. Do, I have it. Do you want me to read sure. it? Sure, sure. I, I can read the statements and then you read that one. I have I have the yeah. one from WCA and the one from Russian Relief. Well, that's I mean, good. I mean, and yeah, of all, course we they're, cannot they're, read all the statements because EAS right. issued the statement, right. other people, other organizations issued statements. So of course it's endless, but I think it's good if we read the WOW one since yeah. uh, we're part of WOW. Yeah, I think so too, since, yeah. Okay. All right, that's all. You tell me when I have it. I have it somewhere, yeah. You have it? Yeah. Okay. I can send it to you too, but I... no, that's okay. You can read it that way. Uh, you know, it's more participative. I think. <laughs> and the nearly eighty-year-old retired. Well, whoever, whoever that is, yes, of course. Join so the Michelle, Michelle, basically the difference of this webinar with the other webinars is that people kind of need permission to get in, right? Whereas in the other webinars, they just pop in, right? No, with this one, they just need the link, but if they're not registered, they'll be an attendee and not a, I guess, a panelist. So they oh, can't turn they, on their they microphone can, and they, they can't turn okay, on their video. But they can still listen. Yes, yes. Everybody can listen. Yes. And they can, yes, everybody can listen and they can also put things in the chat, right? Michelle? Yes. Muggsy's there. Yeah, hi Muggsy. I don't see Muggsy. Do you see well, Muggsy? Muggsy? Yeah, Muggsy. Muggsy, Andrew, Spiegel to everyone. Hello, everyone. You see that? Yeah, and it's in chat. Francesca, well. But we don't we don't see them, right? No, we don't. And okay. we can hear them. And all of this was set up because Michelle thought, I think probably correctly, that we might have Zoom oh, Oh, yes, yeah, so we certainly would have had Russian nationalists popping in, screaming stuff in Russian. So to avoid that, we did the webinar format. If they got to know about this. Oh, they would have known about it. <laughs> oh, yeah, trust me, they would. Look at the numbers are going up and it's still a few minutes early. 41. Does, I, I don't think Putin is going to take any care of anthropologists. You know, no. Screaming. no. <laughs> I mean, he won't check it but yeah i think oh well they have a very large contingent of sp fsb I can't imagine. And, I can't imagine, yeah. and paid employees on social media so yeah i can imagine are those ikea uh bookshelves oh no the unbc uh, <laughs> issue okay Okay, okay. Yeah, so we have 46 people. We're also we're also live streaming, right? I think so. Well, unfortunately, we weren't able to wide stream as widely as possible. And my IT department kind of flubbed it, but at least we're streaming to the WCA page. Okay. Or YouTube? Can people watch it on YouTube? Yeah, well, we don't have the numbers, but so we, we will certainly again record the video. And since once we're ready to start, I will start recording and then. Uh... Okay. All right, that's fine. Sounds good. The numbers oh, away. and Tina and Maria and Emily, it was the last minute, but I really, really, really want to thank you in a sense. Your, your participation here is much appreciated, and especially Tina in the midst of it all. So I guess uh, we value, I guess, your contribution. Thank you for the invitation. Tina, where are you right now? 
Uh, I am in the Western Ukraine, so we managed to get out from Kyiv uh, on the first day, and it took us two days to get here, but now it is quite calm here. Are you in Lviv? No, no. In uh, in the village in Ivano Frankivska Oblast. In Ivano Frankivska Oblast, okay. No. Molisa. Okay, so. So I'll hit the, the record. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so we have one minute to go till two. I think it's two already. Should we start? Uh, go ahead. And we have 50, 51 listeners, right? Michelle? 58. 58. 58. 58. Oh, 58 just goes up. No, no, it's minus the six of us. Yeah, yeah, right. You're okay. Right. Oh, well, the numbers keep going up. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Okay. So, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. This is a very extraordinary special webinar uh, organized by WCA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations. As you all probably know, WCA is part of WOW, the World Anthropological Union, which is made up of WCAA together with IUAES, the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. I first of all want to thank everyone, and I especially want to thank Michelle Bouchard, who was actually the our colleague from British Columbia University, who was actually the convener of this webinar, and also Ricardo Faguago from Mexico, and Virginia Dominguez, our colleagues from the organizing committee of WCA, who really took care of organizing and getting all these people together. Of course, this is, as I said, a special webinar with a lot of responsibility and a very terrible issue or theme, which is the war um, in Ukraine. Actually, we entitled it Empires, Borders and Wars, and Apologists on and in the war in Ukraine. Of course, it could have had many titles, um, but I think that the main issue here is that we want to make everyone aware. And of course, our all our colleagues, anthropologists from all over the world, of what's going on. And uh, so we thought it was timely to do this webinar now. Um, and we thank everyone for being here, especially our colleagues from Ukraine and, and from all the other countries, Poland, etc., who are able to be in. To start with, I want to read two statements. The first of them uh, was actually written by the World Council of Anthropological Associations, the organizing committee. And we stated, uh, it's already online, we stated the World Council of Anthropological Associations uh, Organizing Committee, its organizing committee has discussed and voted to recognize Russian anthropologist petition to the end of the war with Ukraine. Moreover, it condemns all forms of imperial violence and military assault in all regions of the world, including Ukraine, Somalia, Syria, Palestine, Yemen, and elsewhere. It believes that anthropological research contributes to promoting peace and a nuanced understanding of our fundamental humanity. It is also convinced that war disrupts the lives of large numbers of civilians and is an obstacle to scientific interchange that can enhance our capacity to live in peaceful communities. The other statement I want to read is the one written by our courageous Russian colleagues that says, to the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, and to the government of the Russian Federation. We, a group of Russian ethnographers and anthropologists, protest against the military operation of the Russian Federation on the Ukrainian territory. We, Russian anthropologists and ethnographers, have devoted our lives to understanding the cultural and social diversity of humankind and conduct field research in various parts of the world studying social relations and cultural dynamics. We know firsthand how people live during and after wars and political catastrophes. Therefore, we protest when the use of complex humanitarian issues is a pretext of political manipulation and military conflicts. No war can be justified by the search for the historical truth. War cripples human souls. War causes mass loss of life and entails the loss of significant cultural values. War is a moral homicide of present and future generations. The Russian-Ukrainian war leads Russia to international isolation, the damage of its economy, culture, and science. 
The war dooms Russia to hopelessly lagging behind the rest of the world to a sharp worsening of living standards and consequently to the rise of social and ethnic tensions that may lead to internal conflicts. Therefore, we demand one, to immediately cease the military operations on the Ukrainian territory. Two, to immediately withdraw troops from the Ukrainian territory. And three, to start direct negotiations on the ways and timing of the de-escalation of the conflict with the Ukrainian government on an equal footing and without any preconditions. We emphasize this, that this appeal is a voluntary position of a group of ethnographers and anthropologists who care about the future of Russia. This, this statement can also be read in the EASA, the European Association of Social Anthropologists site, and many more are coming. And I would like Virginia, I'll ask Virginia Dominguez, now our colleague from the WCA organizing committee to read yet another statement. Yes, uh, hello everyone. This one is from the World Anthropological Union and it was just, uh, I think approved last night. So I'm not quite sure how public it is. It says, uh, well, statement against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The world has been stunned once again by the unprovoked invasion by Russia into the sovereign territory of Ukraine. We recognize that a tense and problematic historical relationship has existed between Ukraine and Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. However, such an act of military aggression in the present time is both uncalled for and to be universally condemned. All issues are negotiable and can be sorted out peacefully without harm to human beings, both military and civilian. The heart-wrenching news of civilian deaths and innocent children being killed is enough to raise a voice for stopping this war with immediate effect with, with immediate effect without any further loss. The community of anthropologists represented by the umbrella organization of the World Anthropological Union stands with the people of Ukraine and supports who do not support this mindless action. Representing both the International Union of Anthropological and Anthropological Sciences and the World Council of Anthropological Associations, we join all of the academic community and those who believe in humanism to make an appeal to stop this violence and to uh, prevent further human suffering. And thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Virginia. So these are just, like I said, three samples, three examples of statements uh, from many others that are appearing here and there. Um, and, um, and so I will now present the speakers that we have today. Uh, we have Tina Pollack, anthropologist, EASA member, co-founder of the NGO Center for Applied Anthropology in Ukraine. During the last four years, she worked as applied anthropologist in non-commercial projects and as business anthropology in Ukrainian companies. She's the first business anthropologist in Ukraine. Then we'll have Maria Sonivetsky, I hope I'm saying it correctly, associate professor at the Bard College. Uh, her research focuses on post-Soviet Ukraine, where she has pursued interests, including folklore revivals after, the, after state socialism and the effects of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster on the revival of rural musical, musical repertoires. In 2011, to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear catastrophe, she founded the Chernobyl Songs Project, Weaving Culture from a Lost World, a public ethnomusicology program that sought to broaden awareness about the cultural impact of nuclear disaster by reviving ritual song repertoires from rural communities near the accident site. The project culminated with multimedia performances in four cities and a Simithonian folkways recording. Then we'll have Emily Chanel Justice, who is the director of the Temerity Contemporary Ukraine program at the Ukrainian Research Institute, Harvard University. She's a social cultural anthropologist who has been working and doing research in Ukraine since 2012. She has pursued research on political activism and social movements among students and feminists during the 2013-14 Euromaidan mobilization. She has a forthcoming book entitled Without State, Self-Organization and Political Activism in Ukraine. Last, well, last but not least, Michelle Bouchard, our colleague from University of British Columbia and member of the WCA Organizing Committee. 
is a professor of anthropology at the University of Northern British Columbia. He's also a secretary of the World Council of Anthropological Association, a former president of the Canadian Anthropological Society. Michelle has conducted research since the 1990s on issues of Russian nation, Russian nationhood, and nationalism. So I welcome you all. I thank you all um, for being here today. And I will give the word, first of all, to Tina, who has also time constraints, OK? So if you could just respect the five minutes time slot, then we can go around and then a second round, and then we can have discussion. Thank you very much, Tina. Hello, everybody. I'm thankful for the invitation, but I'm not sure whether I can talk normally <laughs> in these days. So um, maybe I will be talking emotionally because I'm really, really angry right now. Uh, so I don't want, uh, I don't know what to talk about anthropology, actually, because everything I could talk is about uh, people close to me and uh, about the situation in the whole. But from the anthropological perspective, we could see um, so like a unique um, unity of the whole nation here. And you can feel it everywhere, uh, on every level, from top to down and from down to top. And um, normally Ukrainians, they uh, are not very united in different um, everyday life situations. But uh, nowadays, uh, in the face of Russian aggression, uh, you can feel it just just everywhere. And people, uh, they are just in the lines uh, to, uh, to help each other. You know, there are so many volunteers, so many men are trying to uh, go to the army or uh, in Ukrainian, it is territorial now, Borona. <laughs> so, like um, close to army um, organizations, and everybody tries to help each other in these situations. And it is, it is hard, but it is uh, really inspired here. And, and the other maybe anthropological uh, topic here is uh, folklore that uh, is everywhere, and now uh, it is mostly in. Uh, meme forms. So uh, a lot of memes appear every day and every second. And uh, that helps us really not to uh, not to cry and uh, to feel brave enough to keep fighting. Uh, so maybe you have some questions, I could answer it. Um, but uh, it's hard for me to describe the situation in the hall because I'm in it. Of course, we understand that completely. That's also why we we started organizing this with some people that then could not make it because we totally understand that you are inside the conflict, which is makes it very, very hard to have the distance to be able to analyze it, right? Okay, so after Tina, thank you so much. Um, we will continue with Maria. Hi everyone, good morning from the East Coast. Tina, thank you so much for making the effort. I can't even imagine what it's like to be there. I am safely here in New York and I am so angry and I haven't slept in a week either. And I am so worried for my friends and family and colleagues there. I'm not going to cry right now, but I'm in the same emotional register as you. I wanna to speak to anthropologists, especially those situated in um, work in the Americas. And I want to suggest that not taking this opportunity to educate yourself about Ukraine, which has historically been narrated through the lens of more powerful actors, especially the Russian Imperial forces, the Soviet forces, and more recently through a Western narrative. This is an opportunity for anthropologists to do what we do well, which is to listen to people on the ground, to listen to Ukrainians, and listen to what they're telling you. I am losing my patience with the kind of epistemic imperialism that I am seeing, which suggests that the exact same discourses of imperialism that operate in the Americas are what is at play in this, in this case. It reveals an ignorance and a laziness, frankly. My work has been on what I term sovereign imaginaries, and I examine this so my first book is called Wild Music, Sound and Sovereignty in Ukraine. And what I was trying to get at through ethnography 
are the very complex ways in which Ukrainians form attachments to the project of Ukrainian statehood. Most Ukrainians do not suffer any delusions about the realities of the failures of the Ukrainian state since independence. Most Ukrainians also understand the hypocrisy of the West. They are not so disillusioned as to believe that there is a simple choice. Yet Ukrainians, because of their geopolitical position, historically and in the present, have to make a choice. And for us to sit on the sidelines and say, well, I don't know, it's too complicated for me to know, or to overemphasize certain narratives that happen to overlap with Putin's narratives, and I'm thinking specifically here about the NATO argument, we can absolutely critique the expansion of NATO in the post-Cold War era. It is a red herring in this moment. Ukraine's accession to NATO is not on the table in part because of the wars that have been stoked by Putin in the last eight years. It is important for us to understand that this is an escalation of an ongoing invasion. This is not something new. I have so much more to say, but I wanna respect the time limit right now. So the last thing I will say is please take this opportunity to listen to the brilliant anthropologists who have been doing work on Ukraine for their, the entirety of their careers. There is a whole crop of Anglophone, Ukraine-focused anthropologists who you should be reading right now. You should be assigning them to your students. Some of them are on this panel. You should listen to Ukrainians when they're telling you that this is a genocide against their country, listen to them. To not listen to them right now is unethical by any code of ethics that anthropologists supposedly subscribe to. War is a time of dehumanization, and I'm not suggesting here that things are simple. We are seeing dehumanization right now in multiple ways. The collapsing of Putin and his enablers with the whole of Russian society who has been living under conditions of repression for the last 22 years. So I want us to be cautious about lumping everyone together into the dehumanized category of enemy. And on the other hand, I wanna be sensitive to the fact that Ukrainians are being dehumanized. In, paradoxically, by being treated as though they were somehow superhuman. These are real people with complex lives. They have all kinds of complex attachments um, to the place that they live. And they're negotiating those in a time of unthinkable crisis right now. So that'll be my last comment for now. Thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you so much for your courageous statements, Maria. I will now, we will now have Emily. Uh, I'm Ali Channel Justice. Emily? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Tina in particular. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. It's, um, you know, many of us are watching very um, concerned about everyone we know in Ukraine. And it's it's every time we hear from somebody we know in Ukraine, it's it it's, gives us, you know, more to go on. And Maria, thank you so much for your passionate statements. I agree 100% I agree with everything that you said. So I'll um, speak a little bit from my own research perspective um, because I think it it is a um, kind of I don't know confirms what Maria is saying and takes it in a in a further direction and and so my my research um, in Ukraine in, in 2013 and 2014 was with student and leftist and feminist activists who are some of the kind of more politically marginalized people in Ukraine at that time in in um, the Euromaidan kind of era. Um, who have been fighting, you know, anti-capitalist battles. They've been critical of both Russian imperialism as well as the hierarchy created by Ukraine's potential accession to the EU. They are outspoken about Ukraine's position in between great powers, right? As always being pulled between two places without giving it having, you know, giving Ukraine the chance to have its own identity. Um, so the people that I have historically worked with have been very critical of kind of both of these perspectives. And I want to make it very clear that right now they are asking for NATO to create a no-fly zone over Ukraine to protect them and their families from near certain death. I mean, the stakes, I cannot stress how high the stakes are. Um, these are people who have spent their entire lives reading Western leftist academics, people who are writing you know, to criticize American imperialism, to criticize capitalism from their comfortable tenured positions in Western academies. And these people have left them behind. And these people are, are spending their time right now debating whether or not it's okay for Ukrainians to ask for these things. 
And I, 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 I know that anthropology has often been a home for these kind of leftist and, and, and critical ideas. Um, and it is disheartening to see so many people who are willing to let narratives of that, that focus on criticism and not on help, they do so much more harm than they do good. And like Maria said, I, I haven't thought about it in this way of this, this superhuman being dehumanizing, but I mean, what, what ordinary people are taking on because of being the only people there to do it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't think we can, um, most of us can really imagine what people are willing to give up and willing to risk. And I should say that these same people who I worked with um, in 2013 and 2014, who spent their time in these protests to try to present kind of um, critical angles about Europe to promote feminist um, ideals in Ukraine's organizing in its claims for European um, for its European future. These are people who are now organizing to help get medical supplies to people who are stuck in in inhumane conditions. They are, you know, writing each other to ask who has a car to get from here to there. Can you help my mom get to the train station? They're organizing all of these things so that they're not left behind. And I think the the absolute and and I should say many of them have also joined the the territorial defense as well. I don't want to leave that out. Um, I just think that that it. Um, you know, like like both Marie and Tina have said, it's we just need to listen to the people who are who are saying things. Um, you know, they're telling us what they would like to see from from us in our positions, um, where we have some control over knowledge and its circulation. Uh, and I think I think as anthropologists, we are built to do that, and that's what we should be doing. So I'll stop there and and see um, what next questions are. Okay, Emily, thank you very much. So last but not least, Michelle Bouchard. Sorry, we'll unmute myself. So I'll be taking a somewhat different perspective, looking at the Russian national narrative and how sadly these events have been going over and over and have been building for the last three decades. And what you, we see is a form of nationalism that puts in, draws in elements of, well, religion, almost, I guess, this messianical, I guess, vision, also tied to gender, because in certain ways, it was one of my articles that I had submitted was kind of censored and not published because I was pointing out it's tied also to a very strong homophobia in the sense there is, I guess, uh, in recent years, you know, Europe has been referred to as Gayropia in the sense there was this idea of this masculine, idealized masculinity that's tied to the myth, I guess, to this ideal of the great patriotic war. And these foundations were laid in the 1990s. So, for example, I was amazed when I was, you know, I guess, visiting Russia in the 19, late 1990s and 1997, the then, their, the then mayor of, I guess, of Moscow, Lushkov, was, in, was pouring huge amounts of money and concrete to build and rebuild the Christ the Savior Cathedral, put up the very gaudy, ugly, in a sense, I guess, a monument to Peter the Great, and he built this huge museum complex on, I guess, Parc Pobiedi, Victory Park, that had this theme of the Russian people rising up to overthrow the fascists and to liberate. But it was very much kind of the curation of the past because they ignored the invasion of Poland, they ignored the invasion of the Baltic states, they ignored you know, the massacre of, I guess, the people, I guess, in the forests of Poland. It was really creating the myth, we, the noble people, are doing this. So there, and at the, at the very, and when you enter the museum of this Parc Pobiedi, there's this huge sword with the, the passage borrowed from the movie Alexandre Nevsky, those who come to us by the sword shall die by the sword. So you create, in a sense, you create this mythical, I guess, structure of the Great Patriotic War, which says, well, Russians, we only, we only defend ourselves and we only liberate. But what we see then in order to justify this, you create the conditions to be liberating, I guess, in quotation marks. And how do you do this? You create the incidents that you can justify yourselves. So we see this in two in one way. So when Putin was coming to power in the 19, in 1999, you have a series of bombings in Moscow. Now I think we could reasonably say that it's, and this was suggested even back then that these bombs were not placed by Chechens who had no interest. They had received they had in a sense they had no interest in restarting war, but likely by the Russian security forces themselves. 
but it it served a per, its purpose. The bombings, the killings of, of I guess, Rush Muscovites and sense, I guess, started, gave the impetus for the second Chechen war where Russia, the Russian forces raised Chechnya, recreated, put their strongman in place to and almost in a, va a vassal relationship. Then we'd see the same thing in Georgia, the Republic of Georgia in 2008. Russia, the Russian forces created the insurgency, gave them, the, I guess, the, the shells. They, they shelled, I guess, the Georgian side. When they retaliated, it was, see, the fascist is attacking the people. And we see this in the speeches of the then kind of the, the president that was put in place by Putin saying, yes, he is the fascist. We are overturning the fascist. We are going there to protect women, children, the elderly. So it was once again using this, this to present this idea of we're not invading, we're just liberating. And so this you have this kind of this ideological justification for imper for, I guess, for, for blatant imperialism. And sadly, I think the West, we buy into it. We look too much saying, yes, there are two sides. There are two sides of the conflict. So therefore, Russia was probably justified. And what did Russia do? Well, it literally incorporated Abkhazia and Southern Ossetia into the Russian Federation. Then in 2014, it did the same thing. Since, and the other process in the sense that started decades before, since 2000, the Russian state had been nationalizing or controlling pretty much all of television stations. So where it mattered, and now the last independent TV station was shut down a few days ago at TV Dost. So you have, in a sense, was the creating of the narratives that are then played endlessly on TV. And you created the same, this, you repeated the same pattern. In, I guess, in Lugansk, there, nobody wanted to fight. No, there was no, Russia created and brought in insurgents. They created the insurgency. They created the rationale. They created the myth of, yes, once again, we are invading to liberate, in a sense. So, so it's part of this ongoing imperial narrative that we simply, that has been there, that has been visible, that can be studied, but we have been too willing, I guess, to, I guess, too willing to simply ignore it and to, I guess, to blame those that are being attacked as opposed to those in the sense that are, I guess, the, the imperialists. So my, my thoughts on the matter. All right. Thank you very much, Michelle. So now we, we have had the first round. We will go back to the first speaker, Tina, again. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on some of the comments that our colleagues made. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will add, will add something about anthropology in Ukraine and anthropologists who study Ukraine. So there is um, a big problem here because uh, the anthropology in Ukraine is quite weak. Yes, so we have ethnology that came from the Soviet Union and traditionally is concentrated on topics uh, of pre-industrial uh, traditions and so on and so on. And uh, modern Ukrainian life is studied here mostly by sociologists and um, honestly saying um, western anthropologists are maybe the only ones who use qualitative methods yes to study modern life in ukraine um, but there is a little problem because um, um, often uh, the narratives about ukraine are a little bit western narratives um, a lot of western anthropologists they are looking here for nationalism and understand this nationalism in quite western categories not from the inside perspective but from the outside perspective that uh, is not always okay for the anthropology and i know that after our victory a lot of um, western scholars will come here and will study this territory because it is quite exotic and it is after the war and it is very interesting to study such uh, such cases yes and in and in this situation, it is very important to study these cases, not from the colonialist uh, perspective, but from the inside perspective. And um, I just uh, ask to do this from the inside perspective in the future. Thank you. Um, I, um, I think what I will comment on right now, sorry, this is a little bit of a turn, Tina, from what you were just offering, but is from the perspective of an anthropologist of music, um, 
is just to counter what should be obvious to all of us, which is that Ukraine is illegitimate because it does not have a history. And I think that one of the ways in which we can see a very centuries long history actually is in Ukrainian musical culture. So I gave a lecture yesterday where I, I expounded upon this, but I'll briefly say that this is not one unitary narrative of Ukraine that we can patch together through a musical history, but it is a narrative that suggests a long history of anti-imperialism. And uh, we can date that back to the 16th century with some of the bard repertoires that were directly lamenting um, the end of the Cossack order and the advancing imperialisms from different corners, including Russia. We can look at examples in the Soviet Union of Ukrainians um, doing what they could in repressive circumstances to assert Ukrainianness, not always through the Ukrainian language. And I think that's also important to underscore here some of the very facile arguments that get made and circulated again by people who haven't bothered to study this um, is that if you are a Russian speaker that you therefore um, are identify with the Russian Federation or are therefore ethnic Russian and that is patently false and there's excellent work done on that as well. Um, that's, that's comparable, right, to saying that if you're an English speaker, you are probably, um, you know, you identify with, the, with Britain or something. I mean, it's, it's almost as absurd as that. Um, so I want to assert that culture is a place where we can actually rebut some of these most pernicious lies. And in the musical case, we can see a really heterogeneous um, patchwork of musical practices that together have come together in, in a quite surprising way, actually, in the post-Soviet era to foster nascent solidarities across populations that may historically have not been collaborating on a, on a project like Ukraine. And I'm thinking specifically of the Klezmer revival that has happened in post-Soviet Ukraine over the last few decades, which is now going to be erased. I'm thinking also of the Crimean Tatar music scene, which has been powerfully expanding, um, which basically was um, eliminated from the peninsula after the annexation in 2014, but has found a new home in mainland Ukraine, and where we're seeing a lot of really interesting um, collaborations between musicians who are um, crossing these historical kind of fault lines to foster new solidarities. I'll stop there for now. Okay, thank you so much, Maria. I just wrote something in the chat asking for, we have around 130, 140 people uh, on Zoom. So if you guys could just write down where you come from, if you wish, of course, uh, it would be interesting for us to know who is joining us in this webinar. And I'll go, now give the floor to Emily. Thanks. So I think I just um, would take the time to, to continue to echo both of, of our speakers' comments. Um, as someone who takes a kind of political anthropology perspective, one of the things that I've always tried to, very hard to represent is not just the diversity of political perspectives that come from Ukraine, but the diversity within these diverse political perspectives. Um, so there's you know, a, a very common perception that there's no feminism in Ukraine, for example. And not just is there feminism in Ukraine, but there are multiple kinds of feminisms and there's multiple discussions about what it means to be a feminist in Ukraine. Some of this is highly influenced by you know, uh, Western European American academic studies of feminism and, and these types of texts. But I really find that many people have um, a strong, I don't know if, if indigenous is quite the right word, but you know, a very um, unique perspective coming out of their experience of being you know, feminist in Ukraine. So I just think it's really important um, that, we, that we remember you know, that it takes time to understand these complexities and how they're connected and, and how they're also, um, how we need to contextualize them in, in this umbrella of larger powers that are you know, always influencing a country like Ukraine. And, and I would also add, I mean, a lot of early Ukrainian feminism is strongly influenced by Russian feminism and, and Soviet era feminism as well. We can't, we can't just because, um, just because we reject Russian imperialism, we can't just say that this, this connection doesn't exist. It's more important to study how 
certain ideas came from from Russian and Soviet times into into Ukrainian political ideology. I think that's actually um, a better solution. And just I see Ed Liebel's question here, and I just want to address, um, you know, obviously many of us are very concerned about the fate of scholars, practitioners, as well as um, issues like libraries, museums, archives, and data repositories. And, and I know, you know, th there's a lot going on right now, and it's, it's fairly chaotic, but there is, um, there are uh, emergency scholar funds, there's a new initiative designed to be responsive to displaced scholars. It's kind of it was designed in response to this particular crisis, but the idea of the people who are working on it is to create this initiative to help for future problems of displacement as well. Um, and that's something that we at Harvard are working with some of our colleagues on kind of centralizing information for displaced and emergency scholar funds. And I would also add that several institutions, including Harvard, are also working with institutions in Ukraine to preserve archival material. We know that the archive, many of the archives in Ukraine have worked really hard in the past decade or so to digitize a substantial amount of their material. And we are helping work with people to get that into some of our universities that have you know, the, the resources to pay for cloud space that we can share. Those are sorts of things that our universities, you know, if you're somebody who's feeling very helpless, these are things that matter right now. So it's, you know, if you have resources like that, that you can offer, if you have, you know, ways that you can place scholars from Ukraine into programs, um, you know, to help keep them safe, those are things that, that people are asking for and that we're working towards. So I just want to make clear that there's a lot of different people from a lot of different angles, including people in Ukraine who are, you know, they're focused on, you know, Obviously, you know they're they're focusing on protecting themselves and their families, but they are also making sure to protect things like archives and and resources. And so, I just um, I just want to make sure that everyone listening kind of knows that these initiatives are in the works. Sorry, um, I was muted. Thank you very much, Emily, for all this, Michelle. As I, I used to reaffirm and say what Tina was saying, the importance of getting the insider's perspective. And because what when I was doing my research, I guess in Narva and Estonia, looking at this idea of Russian nation was interesting the idea of the Holzna, I guess the, the, the place where one is from. For the people in, in the city, they saw their Holzna as their city, their region, their home, their family. They did not want to be part of any larger, greater Russian, like Russian empire. They they were quite you know, happy to be part of Estonia, to be Russian or to be, I guess, a Russian speaking Ukrainian or German or whatever it may be, but still have, in a sense, I guess, the, the place of belonging was tied to the, I guess, uh, to the locale. And in certain ways, I think, Putin oddly seemed to have applied almost Western concepts of nation in his hopes, I guess, to an invasion. Because what we do know is that, I guess, a few days ago, three days after the invasion, the Russian, I guess, national news service released an article praising Putin for the recreation of the Russian world and the glorious invasion. It was deleted a few minutes later, but it was copied and archived. And so we can see that they had underestimated. They had, in certain ways, projected almost this Western idea of nationalism that the people will be greeting us with flowers and helping us to invade all the way to Kiev. And they themselves did not understand the, the, how the people were living, even Rus Russian speakers in Eastern, I guess, in Eastern Ukraine. So, so I think we, I think, I, I think I certainly affirm in a sense, I guess, the importance of understanding the local and this is, I guess, is important both of anthropology, but as a larger global perspective as well. But what what is somewhat, I think, perhaps, I guess, perplexes me and somewhat, I guess, the uh, saddens me is that even though I can understand Russians being bombarded every day by the Russian, I guess, the Russian propaganda believing these myths, I'm somewhat surprised when I have people in Canada who t start telling me things about yes we the west is to blame yes it was about nato yes that there were all these the women being killed in a sense in eastern ukraine for eight years so so this this propaganda has permeated sadly in a sense i guess even i guess to to individuals who are not political who have no, no ties with ukraine yet somehow believe it so i think perhaps we should be looking at in an era where everything is fake and nothing is real yet we believe anything what what are the long-term implications for us as as a part of our greater humanity. So I'll end it there. So thank you. And thank you, I guess, for the three others who participated. It was very wonderful to have you and to listen to you, I guess, uh, and what your thoughts. Thank you very much, Michelle, and to all the other ones, uh, Tina, Emily, and Maria. So now we have a question from Anna. I don't know if Virginia was uh, wanted to talk. Virginia? 
and to you? No. No? Okay, so we have a question from... We have a question from Anna. Yeah. Michelle Bouchard mentioned that Russia acts with the idea we are invading to liberate. It is also a narrative of the US. Don't right. you think it is not imperialism? This is great power politics. As, so I, I think this is something we can discuss. Uh, as per John Mesher, accordingly, don't you think that Ukraine is also the West's fault? Was it the US and the UA role in this conflict? Um, yeah, not taking away the terrible fact of invasion of independent country and killing innocent people, of course. So do anyone wants to address this, Michelle? Sure, I guess I'll start. Well, I, being perhaps old, too old now, I can actually remember some of these historical events. I think the Americans, yes, we can counter American imperialism, but nonetheless, the United States has had at least the attempt to try to put it under the global banner. So if we look at reifying, I remember quite well, in the sense, I guess, the debates that were happening in the UN before the invasions of Iraq, you know, the, the trying to prove that there were, in a sense, I guess, uh, weapons of mass destruction. So there was even and there was the I guess the attempt to create in a sense a global I guess a global community to take part I guess in the war so so even though yes they are both perhaps elements of I guess imperialism nonetheless there was an attempt to create if only the facade but at least there was certainly an attempt to at least to create it to do it under the international banner and this can also be applied to Kosovo it can be applied to I guess to other contexts as well and what perhaps shock and shock, shocks me also about Russia, what is happening now, Putin pretty much, you know, the pre-recorded in the sense saying we are now in a sense declaring war was delivered just as the Security Council of the UN chaired by the Russian, I guess, the Russian ambassador was discussing it. So in certain ways, it was, to put it succinctly, giving the middle finger to, I guess, to, I guess, international organizations saying we will do what we want to do and we have nukes, so don't do anything against us. So, so yes, there is American imperialism, but at, for quite often, and since at least one was for these large initiatives, they were at least, they tried to do it under at least a veneer of an international, I guess, an international rights laws, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all I have to say. Can, can I add just briefly also that I think that some of the great power politics um, interpretations are true, but it is also true that those discussions deny Ukrainians any agency, right? It just re-inscribes them as the eternal geopolitical pawns trapped between global actors. So yes, we can absolutely indict the EU and the US's role. Um, we should, in this moment, condemn the potential genocide that is happening that was unprovoked and unjustified. And so I do think it's really important to kind of remain attuned to the moment of crisis right now and to put pressure on our leaders not to re repeat um, the egregious acts <laughs> of invasion that the US is culpable for, for example. And I agree with the comment in the chat about Iraq. It's unforgivable. Um, but this whataboutism in the moment can kind of blur um, some of the specifics of the moment that we're in. And I, I just wanna assert again that Ukrainians do have their own agency and even Ukrainians who are ambivalent about the EU, for example, understand that that might be a path that they would prefer rather than to be resubjugated into the old Russian empire. Uh, it, Clara and I are going to alternate reading out the questions and so forth. Emily has already uh, addressed Ed Lebo's thing, so I'm, unless Ed wants to add something in the chat, that's fine. But there is a question in the Q&A that I don't know if everybody can see. So I'm gonna read it. It's from Muggsy Spiegel in uh, South Africa. Uh, question for Michelle, it says, what is the relationship between the changing character of capitalism as it has affected Russia, particularly during the post fortis period its relationship with its previous USSR vessels and the processes of globalization. How is that playing out now in relation to Ukraine? Jill, since it's for you, it doesn't have to be just you, but you should at least start. It comes back, I guess, to these, and I, I you know, I, I study national narratives. That's my that's my thing. So, but also question of national narratives: Who will you blame? Who do you blame for your suffering? So, I think what what we see is that it's also 
when it comes to nation nationalism was what you forget. What do you, who do you blame? What do you forget? So in certain ways, I guess with the 1990s, with the collapse of the ruble, at that point, I think the ruble was taking one ruble for its 30 some thousand, I guess $1 US for 30 some thousand rubles. But there was kind of, but rather than saying, listen, this was the part of the communist legacy, the economic legacy, when there was a lot of money, people with money in their bank accounts, but there was nothing to buy. So what are you going to do with money that you can't use? You put in your bank account. So, so thus, when you have, after 1991, the liberalization, you have all this money in circulation and things to buy, but all of a sudden you have the hyperinflation. But rather than looking, what, what did we do in the past? And what are our responsibilities? What are our perhaps actions that led to this was blaming the West, blaming somebody else, blaming perhaps, I guess, the others. So in certain ways you create, it's the idea in a sense, I guess, is how to deflect and perhaps, I guess, not, not take into what, I guess, are, are what we have done as also part of it. And, and again, coming back to the World War II, in in the this great you know Park Pavieti memorial complex, there was the letter signed by Beria to basically to order the execution of these. I guess I can't remember the numbers. I guess in the forest. I guess of Poland, but it was buried way down at the bottom. So in certain ways, it's you forget in the sense that you want to remember the great victory, but you forget the invasion of Poland. You forget the atrocities. You forget your role of culpability. And I think with the economic, we see a similar thing. In the sense is that you. We blame the West for the, the 1990s, but we don't look at oil prices. We don't look at, in a sense, the role of the oil in, I guess, the, the collapse, let's say in, in the early, I guess, the early 80s and how, I guess, so, I guess, in, I guess in the late 80s. So, so in certain ways, it's kind of, it's the whole idea of the truth and the reconciliation. In certain ways, it's to be able to really, to change, you must also be look at the past truthfully. And I don't think this has happened in Russia, I guess, in the Russian Federation. So I'm not too sure whether I have wandered off and answered the question, question Muggsy. Maybe in the meantime, um, other people might want to say something. I know the question was addressed to you, Michelle, yeah. but anybody? No? Tina, Emily, or Maria? Otherwise, we have more questions here. There's a question. Um, in a global perspective from uh, Mikhail Lukovsky, in a global perspective, a lot has been written about coloni colonialism and post-colonialism, much less about communism and post-communism. I think that one can see the whole tragic invasion in terms of the collapsing empire that tries to recuperate and expand again. Do you somehow agree? I don't know who wants to address this. Nobody, come on. I can I can start by by saying um, when I I had a in in 2012 when I was doing some preliminary research with activists I was very stuck on this post communism framework in trying to understand Ukraine and it was leftist and student activists in Ukraine who told me that we should be using a post colonial framework to understand Ukraine and ever since that has been something that I have tried to apply and balance because you know I mean again. We're, as anthropologists, we should be we should be very strongly influenced by people um, who we're working with, who are telling us that we're thinking about things wrong. You know, we should be listening to that. So I think um, so. Yes, I mean, I think that that there's an intersection here between post-communism and post-colonialism, or colonialism and communism. This perspective has influenced um, where Ukrainian activists position themselves. Like I mentioned before trying to, to push back against this betweenness. Um, they, they see Ukraine as having had a colonial relationship with Russia in the past, not just in the Soviet period, but also in the imperial period. Um, and it's important to, to detach Putin's stated objectives now from these Soviet ideas um, because they're very different and very, um, very pernicious in a different way. I think that's just important to note. So um, I think it, if we look at a kind of big picture response to this question, I, I think we have to maybe rethink the lens. You know, I don't know. We've been talking within within our small groups of like the the Soyuz post colonial or post communist research group. You know, uh, is post socialism dead? Is post is commu post communism like a useful framework anymore? And I, I think um, in terms of thinking anthropologically from where we are, yes, we need to start rethinking those terms. 
Um, I don't know if that helps us understand what's going on today, but I think it should influence how we see Ukraine moving forward. If I can say a few words, I'd say what you have in a sense, they kept the imperial vision, but almost under a new, I guess, a neoliberal state. So in certain ways, you have the Russian center of Moscow, and there's a few large cities where most of the money is, I guess, is concentrated. But you have this really, the, the investment, in, in, I guess, in police forces, the FSB, I guess, the secret forces, you have probably more, I guess, uh, police services in, in Russia now than you had the Soviet Union, and even though it was half the population. I'll give you a little research anecdote. When I was in Siktivkal, there was in the main campus of the main university, there was a nice cafe in the fourth floor where I'd go every morning to go get a coffee. So it's a you know, and then I would go, go. But one day, my colleague, that since I was working with, said, Michel, stop going to that cafe. I got a call from the FSB. They tell me that there is a secret computer training office in that building, and we don't want to see him there. So, so you can imagine that this I'm a nobody in a small little city in, in Sixty County. Somehow, there's probably a very thick file against on me, I guess, in the FSB offices. So I think we, as a state, there is, in a sense, a great deal that was invested in creating this very imperial straight, stru straight structure. And we see, sadly, in Ukraine, perhaps the same tendency. In, in other words, the soldiers mainly coming from poor rural areas and elsewhere in Russia are being used as cattle fod fodder in order to create the, the empire that will serve the benefits of those, I guess, of those, of those in power. So you have, and you have, in a sense, the pattern is said. Belarus is like Chechnya. Both have the strong strong man that is there holding power at all costs, but is fiercely loyal to Putin. And the goal was, I guess, to recreate based on this article that was, you know, that was leaked, that was published and taken down. The goal was to do the same thing in Ukraine, create a vassal state where you would have, in a sense, one Putin strongman in place, in a sense, holding down the, the population by any means possible. So, and then the question is, will, will, would Putin stop at Ukraine? I have my doubts. So I guess it's I guess what would be next? Northern Kazakhstan? Would it be, I guess, perhaps uh, trying to see whether you know, parts of Estonia, whether NATO would really fight back? So, so unfortunately, again, the narrative is there. We have to stop ignoring the narratives that are actually that are publicly available and visible and, and I guess take them, take them for, at their word. Exactly. And Moldavia has been there, the Transnistria that is maintained by the Russian armed forces. Okay, but but uh, please, but I, I don't know what that was uh, an addition to, Michelle. Oh, it's just one of the comments I'd be pointing out in the sense that trans, Transnistria, in the sense where you have this little slice of land where you also you have the, the let's say, the those who are trying to keep it from being part of Moldavia, but it's largely supported by, I guess, the Russian armed forces. Okay, uh, thanks. Anybody else? Otherwise, I have a question I want to read out here or from Adam. It's a question for Maria in particular. Uh, it says, you spoke briefly about an epistemic imperialism that you identify in many anthropologists' approaches to Ukraine. Could you elaborate a bit on exactly what you had in mind here? Maria? Sure, yeah, I'm improvising that phrase, but I'm sure others have written about it. I, um, I think what I'm thinking about specifically is the way that we, um, here, here's how I'll, I'll talk about it. Anthropologists have been interested in decolonizing our discipline. Um, and that has been, there's a new kind of wave, right, of those debates, um, particularly in the North American Academy, which is what I'm most familiar with. Um, and part of the discourse of decolonization has to do, of course, with who we lean on, right, for the theories that we deploy, the kind of marriage of the on the ground ethnographic work with the bigger, you know, theoretical frameworks that we bring in. So there's a citational politics at play um, that demands that we start citing local scholars, for example. Um, and I think we can scale up from that to see how there's an epistemic imperialism here that reflexively people who have never studied Ukraine, which is frankly most anthropologists, rely on the kind of dominant frameworks that are available to them. They've studied settler colonialism, but only in the North American context. You cannot take that case and just wholesale import it to the Russian Ukrainian context. There is a nuanced and deep history there. It is not analogous to the settler colonial context in North America. Similarly with discourses of race, the Soviet Union had a very particular discourse of race in which blackness signified things that are distinct from the kinds of discourses of race that are operative in North America. We can talk about 
anti-Blackness as a global construct, but we also need to be mindful of the internal logics of race as they exist, and especially of ethnicity, and most importantly, perhaps, nationality, which was the key term of Soviet taxonomy um, in, for the duration of the 20th century. So again, to say, I'm gonna impose this discourse of race that I happen to know because I studied the Americas, and I'm just going to like fly it over to this part of the world is to me a form of epistemic imperialism. Adam, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, well, you answered it for me, but I, who knows? Uh, Clara, your turn. Question. I have a question now from Carmen Rial, uh, where she says, oops, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, wait, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, okay, yeah. I have the sound now. Okay, so I was reading Carmen Rial's question on, uh, I would like to know how the social movements in Russia react to the invasion. Is there specific reactions, feminist groups, for instance? Can anyone answer that? Quiet. Come on, Michelle. Emily. I, I want to give it to the chats for somebody else in a sense, I guess. And okay. also, I guess we perhaps be interesting to compare, I guess, with Ukraine in a sense, I guess, so we can maybe have. By the way, what we can see, and there was an attempt, I guess, and this was a project which I did many years ago, I guess, in the early 2000s, I guess, in Perm. One of the, the, the consequences of the Soviet Union is that, in a sense, I guess, civic engagement had been so long, the Soviet been managed by the states. So, so in other words, there weren't, there were, the idea of an NGO was almost unthinkable. All NGOs were state organized, state run, state, say, so there was kind of a, so one of the challenges I think that Russia faced in the 1990s and the early 2000s was how to create a viable, perhaps, I guess, uh, these, these civic structures in a sense that could, I guess, that could react, could, in a sense, uh, could, I guess, to, could try to put a different vision, I guess, to, I guess, to the state. But now, of course, in Russia, that is being cracked down. And one of the ways that they do this is if an organization is deemed to have been collaborating with foreign intervention, they can be shut down. So, so there's certainly what little was, has grown is now the state is actively seeking, in a sense, to clamp down on. So, so in certain ways, there are are, will we return to the year perhaps the Soviet in the sense where the only resistance was jokes around the table in the sense of the anecdote. So, so I think in certain ways right now, those who do go out and try in a sense to protest are the ones who are arrested. But until there are millions of people that rise up in Moscow, I guess, and surround the Kremlin, I'm cynically thinking there ain't much that's going to happen. So maybe Tina, I guess uh, you might have some thoughts perhaps, I guess, uh, the differences, I guess, with Ukraine, I guess, uh, and, and Russia. Can, can, can I explain? Wait a second, Tina. Maybe it would be good to know if anybody has reached out to you from Russia? Uh, well, let's say huh? this way. People are keeping quiet. And I've been quite disappointed in the sense, I guess, people who should know better really have, in the sense, I guess, are towing the state line. And it's, kind of, and it's very dis disappointing. People who some of these speak Russian, speak English, in a sense, they are very capable of seeing, but they believe that, yes, there was this massacre, the, I guess, the, the Nazis in, German, I guess, in Eastern Ukraine were killing all these women. It basically has been swallowed hook, line, and sinker, sadly. But there was, I did, one Russian colleague did reach out to me, in a sense, he was quite Quite saddened, I guess, by the events. But again, you know, there, so there is a resistance at first, certainly, but I think the majority still probably at least 60% based on from Levada are still in favor of, I guess, the I guess the policies of I guess of Putin and Co. Okay. Can we hear from Tina? You asked Tina. Yes, yes. Uh, so maybe the main difference is attitude to freedom. So we had already Maidan in Ukraine and uh, we had uh, Orange Revolution before that. And we know that we could fight for this freedom. And we know that um, there will be one moment uh, when there will, will be so many of us and that no one could do anything to us. And I think maybe people in Russian Federation don't, feel, don't, don't have that feeling that the, in, in such moment there will be so many of them that nobody could fight them. Um, I don't know the, the other sort of, but still I think that they don't feel it yet, I hope. Could I ask, uh, maybe there are listeners who know about the social movements in, in Russia as well? We can read them out loud. Uh, you can do the chat or uh, 
the question, no? In addition to the presenters here? No, but uh, uh, Virginia, there's another question on the chat. No, I know, I know. I was just wondering so yeah, if, there was, yeah. if there was anybody here besides Michelle, Emily, no? You don't want to say anything? My research is in Ukraine, not in Russia, so I, I don't really no, can't that's, comment. That's what I thought, right? That's what I thought. Okay, anybody? No, apparently not. Okay, if you think about it, we can go back to this because I think Carmen Rial's question is, is very useful and important. Anyway, uh, I don't know who ISA is, who's been writing a lot in the chat, but anyway, it has a question. Um, how does Putin and the Moscow Patriarchate reflect Cyrus imperialism and Cyrus culture? I often think about this idea. Anyway, anybody? I, I, I personally like to think that Putin is trying to recreate uh, the Soviet empire, but without communism. So then I think, ah, Peter the Great. Okay. Yeah. Anybody? No. I'm I'm not an expert on um, on religion in this part of the world, so I, this will be a little bit superficial. But what I can say is that there is a now centuries long history of contestation over where, uh, you know, where Kiev, where Kiev fits in to this story, right? Whether Kiev is in fact the capital of Ukraine or whether it is in some ways the origin for, um, for the Russian, the modern Russian project. And a lot of that has to do with religion. Um, Putin's messaging about this neo-imperial war is theological in tone a lot of the time. It has a messianic rhetoric about restoring things as they should be. And this is also a theological justification. Under the more nationalist president who preceded Zelensky, there were important moves made to differentiate between the cave and the Moscow, Moscow patriarchates of the Orthodox Church. And, um, and so that's part of the story here as well, right? That there was the feeling probably on Putin's side that the Ukrainians were moving further away yet again. I also really wanna underscore that Ukraine is a multi-confessional state and it always has been. Um, in addition to the um, Orthodox Church, there's in the West, especially the Uniat Church, which is a form of Eastern Catholicism. Um, there has been a Jewish population on the territory of Ukraine for generations um, who suffered, um, who continue to suffer anti-Semitism, but who have also been rebuilding institutions that are now significantly threatened um, by this war. And there's also an indigenous population of Sunni, pr predominantly Sunni Muslim, Crimean Tatars, um, who many of whom have fled after the 2014 annexation and are now uh, integrated into, the, into life in mainland Ukraine. Um, so the religious dynamics are real and Putin's kind of, again, reductive narrative, right? Um, smacks of the old Tsarist um, maxim about uh, religion and the other two items that were part of that, which I can't remember at the moment. So, well, if I if I can say a few words, like building upon what Maria is saying, is that the Russian Orthodox Church has a centuries long history of being quite imperial itself. But if we look, the main difference, I guess, with Orthodoxy, you have the patriarch, and there was a tradition that if you have a large enough group of people speaking a language, that you create a, a separate church and sense with the liturgy in their language and sense for the population. Thus. The, the senior patriarch is the patriarch of Constantinople, aka Istanbul, who, and then you have, I guess, patriarchs in sense, I guess, uh, across, I guess, various different, I guess, very, very different, I guess, Orthodox churches. And there was, in my own research, in the 14th century, there was an attempt to create a separate Orthodox church, I guess, for the, for the, for, I guess, for the Perm, aka the Komi, in their language, but that was crushed by, I guess, by both, I guess, Muscovy and, I guess, the Orthodox Church in the 15th, I guess, in the 15th century. So they, so the church really, and even then you were reading, in a sense, in this 14th century description, people saying, well, why, why, why preach to them in their language? They should just learn the Husky, the, the Russian language. So there was even a very almost colonial imperial network idea in the Russian Orthodox, I guess, church in the, I guess, in the 13th, I guess, in the 14th century in the 15th century. And that carries to this day, one of the main things what Ukraine, the Orthodox Church, 
was seeking to, in a sense, and got through the benediction of the Constantinople Patriarch to create a patriarch for the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. In other words, there would be the equivalent state equivalent of for the Orthodoxy, where you would have, in a sense, I guess, the patriarch for your own national Orthodox Church. And the Moscow Patriarch resisted this. The Russian state resisted it. They did everything to make sure that they, this, this would not happen because they want to reimpose this, perhaps this imperial colonial church vision to have the Orthodox in Ukraine all being under the Moscow Patriarch and not this now new eventual, I guess, Ukrainian Patriarch. All right. Your turn, Clara. Clara, unmute. Okay, sorry, the unmute was not working. Okay, we have another question here. So we've been discussing this relation between Tsar and church and Putin. <laughs> and, and now there's another question from Evia, who's I suppose from Hong Kong, got some question about misinformation, especially the artificial ones. Did it play some role in the war between Ukrainian and Russia? How it works and how much it affects both societies? This is her question. I don't know who wants to answer it. I'm happy to speak to this a little bit, but I'm, Tina, do you wanna talk a little about like stop fake and those kinds of attempts? To... Maybe I will add okay. you. After... You'll add after me, okay. So um, yeah, misinformation has been a huge prong of this war, uh, at least for the last eight years, but arguably much longer than that. Um, Russian state media presence in Ukraine is very strong. It's been almost the only information feed for Crimeans, uh, annexed Crimeans and people in the Eastern um, Donbass and Luhansk regions. Um, and this kind of narrative about some of the narratives that we've already rehearsed, right? The narrative that Russia doesn't start wars, it ends wars. The narrative, the messianic tone about restoring um, a unitary whole because there's no distinction between Ukrainians and Russians um, and all kinds of other conspiracy theories, frankly, ranging from the absolutely ridiculous to the kind of believable. Um, the, the fact that neo-Nazis and drug addicts are holding hostage the Ukrainian public, these are the dominant narratives that have been circulated. Um, if you're following the news, you know that Dosh and Radio Echo have been shut down um, in Russia in the last 24 hours. These were the last, the last two independent, semi-independent media channels for the Russian public. This is absolutely devastating and portends even less access to information. They're also cracking down on social media within Russia today. So yes, misinformation has had a huge role in all of this and unfortunately can probably be attributed to a lot of the ignorance on the part of um, the Russian public today. And the last thing I will say is that, um, you know, the, the term of art right now is, what is it, special military operation, is that right? Is that the right translation? They're not calling it a war, right? In, within the Russian media ecosystem. Not calling it a war means that certain things, you know, are more ambiguous and people are really invested in believing that this is not a war, that this is a very targeted and limited strike. Um, and so just the fact that the ordinary Russian person does not have access to any information about what is actually happening on the ground in Ukraine today should be also evidence of the media environment and it's completely closed and repressive state. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. I will add maybe that um, sometimes I have a feeling that uh, people in Russian Federation, they live like in all this Huxley world, uh, yes, and uh, so where everything is opposite to the reality. Um, but I don't agree that they couldn't get any real information, yes, it depends um, on their ability and uh, whether they do want to do this or not, because uh, my uh, relatives from Moscow, they called my mom and uh, they were just retranslating uh, those propaganda messages. And when we, we were talking what is happening here, they just didn't believe us. And this is a huge problem 
on the global level and on the local level and on the le level of different Ukrainian families. So it is everywhere. And a lot of Russian channels, um, they um, give information to people in Ukraine. For example, in Eastern Ukraine, they are listening to information from Russia. Um, young Ukrainian people, they are listening to Russian bloggers and, and so on and so on. And this propaganda, it has so many faces. It is so different. It, is, uh, so many, it has so many audiences. So it is really hard to fight it. Yeah, and I would say we we can't underestimate this. I guess this propaganda. It's, for example, the one the one that I'm now hearing is that even when they acknowledge that yes, Kharkiv is being carpet bombed, but they'll say, well, maybe it's the Ukrainian forces that are bombing Ukraine. So now, even when they have to acknowledge yes, the city is being bombed, they start throwing out these alternative interpretations and send. And I had to tell somebody, listen this makes zero sense. We have to apply the Occam's razor principle. The simplest solution is the easiest. You have the Russian army invaded and cities are bombed. The logical outcome is that Russian forces are bombing Ukrainian cities. But there is this creation of alternative alternative explanations and sadly people latch onto it. So. And uh, may I add a, a little bit? So uh, I think that after the war, uh, there will be a big chance for oral history because the narratives and that people will be um, telling after the war about their everyday life, about what uh, did they see, it will be very important, not just um, like stories, emotional stories, but like historical facts. So, and we could use this information and we could pick up these informations as scientists and as anthropologists and historians and so on. Tina, but I think that's the point, right? Because as we know, historical facts are also manipulated. So the thing is to, to get them right, it depends. I mean, I've read uh, school manuals here in Portugal that talk about uh, you know Portuguese in Brazil as being great people. And, and, and of course, all European devastated the Amerindians. So history has its own readings also. So it's very important to try to get across the clear and correct uh, story, right? Can I also just jump in to say that Tina's point was absolutely correct. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of writing in recent days about how this is really the first social media war. And so the fact that there are really so many different channels um, for people to, to get access, but there's also, it seems, a, a generational divide um, among the Russian public about the kinds of people who might seek out YouTube or Telegram channels, right, versus the kind of people who are the equivalent of, you know, the people who watch only CNN or only Fox News. Can I, can, uh, Clara, sorry, can I ask something before I, 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 I do my official role? Uh, you know, I've been wondering, you know, Putin has done all sorts of things, but uh, he apparently has not shut down the internet. Is that correct? And it's sort of surprising to me, isn't it? Michelle, you're talking, but you're muted. For some reason, the fan here started going on overload almost as uh -huh. a jet engine. But what we see now, now increasingly, they're moving to shut it off. Now, for example, I've heard cases that in order to access Twitter, you need to go through a VPN. And there was a balloon that was floated about, in a sense, creating you know, a Cyrillic-based internet, aka cutting off the Russian internet from everybody else. So, so I think now it's baby steps. Now, now in order, you have to register through a government state site to get onto Facebook. And if you share... I guess information, let's say from a Ukrainian source or from other sources on your Facebook page and you're in Russia, you can face fines. And if you don't pay those, I think it's a, a huge sum for Russian standards. And if you don't, and then the next stage is to put you in jail. So I think slowly but surely the open access to the internet is being curtailed and the police state, I guess all those F FSB agents that they have been paying for all these years are gonna be, you know, I guess seeking out in the sense, I guess the, the ones who are a bit too active in, I guess, in sharing information that doesn't conform to the state narrative. Thank you. Okay, well, my, my actual role, may I go on? Okay, so uh, I think the next thing here is uh, a comment. Uh, Michal Bukowski, who is in Poznan, uh, Poland, wrote neoliberal totalitarian imperialist post-communist regime, but I didn't know what he was referring to. So I asked him privately to elaborate, which he did. And I don't know if everybody has seen this, so I'm going to read what he then wrote. 
Post-socialism is for me a form of neoliberal type of capitalism. It seems that in Russia, it took a shape of oligarchy that is protected by strict political regime led by a KGB and combined with imperialist interests and aspirations rooted in the past imaginary of great Russian world. Ruski Mir, okay. Anybody wanna comment on that? I'll just, I'll say quickly maybe that, um the oligarchic structure is is well documented and i think that's accurate i also just want to point to the complicity of the west and the us and canada in harboring and enabling a lot of that wealth hoarding so i think this moment will be interesting when they're starting to seize apparently some of the super yachts of the oligarchic class um when we might see the seizure of some of the apartments that are owned by oligarchs in london and in the us and so i i don't think it's fair to treated as a closed system. That's all I mean to say, really. Yeah, I don't add, it's a changing system, it's an evolving system. So I, I was kind of laughing when Putin in his weird rambling speech says, oh, well, Ukraine is corrupt. Saying, well, Russia has simply, the only difference is centralized corruption. So whereas in the 90s, it was more kind of the petty bribes given to police officers, now it's the corruption. And even with the oligarchs, in the sense with the millionaires, the billionaires, you have changed from those who made their billions in the crazy days of the 1990s, taking over state corporations and making them their own, to now the new billionaires are the ones who are part of the state political structure, who were the former heads of the FSB, who were the head of the secret police, who are now the ones who are on the chairs and the CEOs of these corporations. So even within Russia, there's a growing shift in the type of oligarch where you go, there's oligarchs that, that owe their money directly to Putin and not anybody else. Okay, there's a there's a comment here. It's more a comment than a question, but perhaps we can um, elaborate on that or discuss this. It's from uh, Vali, Valina. No, wait a second. No, it's from Vanetta Kalikova, and she says there are numerous individuals and joint anti-war petitions in Russia right now from scholars, specifically from anthropologists, from stand-up com comedians. IT professionals, designers, people who work in arts and culture, journalists, men, universities, etc. There is also an anti-war feminist group. So this also answers some of Carmen's questions. There are attempts to gather for anti-war demonstrations that, not, that end up being futile as police take, takes protesters to jail. The problem is that people don't feel they are supported by the majority. And now expressing your opinion has become even more dangerous as we are not allowed to say war or invasion and citizens are reminded that you should that you show if you show any kind of support to ukraine it could be classified as treasons as a treason i think people who want to speak up still do speak up but at great risk to themselves this is what our colleague i think from russia says and actually related to this i have my own question which is I've been talking, of course, with a lot of people here in Portugal. Of course, we get the news as everyone else with you know, people in, in the major cities, St. Petersburg and Moscow, some against the war, of course, and some that you know, have the Putin's discourse that this is all uh, NATO's and the US and EU uh, fault. But some of my colleagues as an anthropologist also think that Russia will actually implode from the inside, that there will be divisions within Russia and that will be, there will be people that will start, there will be groups that will start being against Putin. And once the bodies of the dead soldiers start coming in, if Putin now does decide to set in the martial law, which has been spoken about in the news, I don't know if he will or not, if he cuts out all the internet connections. So if the Russian people really start suffering directly, which of course they are already, especially with the with the lockdowns in SWIFT system, but especially with the dead young uh, soldiers, um, will, will Russia actually implode? This is one of the things that has been talked about a lot here by anthropologists in Portugal. They think that, yes, if we are optimistic, Putin will end up imploding. <laughs> the system. I'm I'm optimist, but I don't know if I'm that optimist. I would like to know what your view is on this. Is, would this be possible? Because Russia is so large and so diverse, right? That's what we've been talking about here. 
Maybe I will say several words. So um, I think that the main point is that uh, they do have uh, to go to the streets, not for us, not for Ukrainians, but for themselves. They are already like outsiders in the whole world. And um, I think uh, that's stupid to sit at home uh, when you can do at least something for yourself, not for us. So this is the main point I am standing on, because uh, I don't uh, believe in the empathy of Russian people in the whole. Yes, some of them may be liberals, maybe scientists, uh, some of them are my friends. Yes, but um, in the whole Russia, they maybe don't feel empathy for Ukraine, but uh, they have to feel um something that will change their lives. And if they want to live Mm, not so bad as they will live in the soonest future. They have to do something for themselves. Exactly. But that's that's exactly what I was mentioning. What some people here in Portugal are discussing is that one, well, if they're suffering themselves, then it will they will act because that's the normal human reaction, right? Well, they will react, but they'll say, oh, well, we have to, we have to, we sense this. There's a, an old Russian saying that's been around since the 19th century, you know, what kills a German is healthy for a Russian. So that there is, it'll be kind of the state will present their suffering as the proof of the nationhood. And unlike those lesser, I guess, lesser people in those Europe, they can, they can tough it out. So until the FSB and their page, they stop being paid. Until you have a few million people that rise up in a sense, march to the to the center of Moscow. If there's a few demonstrations, a few Russian villages, who cares? Nobody will care. In a sense, I guess. And does Putin really care about the little groups here and there protesting? No. Just as long as the FSB are well fed and I guess and happy, that is his 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 power. And 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 I've heard, and I'm not too sure. I guess uh, Tina can maybe talk. I've heard these you known some of the Russian videos being shared in a sense. One captured like a soldier, I guess, in I guess in Ukraine who was saying, yes, no, the wounded soldiers, the FSB were coming up and shooting them, killing them to make sure in a sense they were not taken prisoner. So so clearly you have the soldiers, but almost in the Soviet period in a sense where you had the commissars, you have the FSB keeping an eye on the soldiers to make sure that they do the right thing in a sense if necessary. So I think we can't underestimate either the the regime that has been put into place, I guess, over these several decades. Can I also add, just to echo some of what has been said, that there's, I think, a risk that the suffering will just reinforce Putin's all narrative of victimization, right? He's already like entrenched these st structures of grievances. So I, I think that that's another way that it could play out. Um, but I, my hope right now is, this is in the chat as well, is that once the repercussions of the war are obvious, right, once the body bags start returning to Russia, that at that point, people may have to really wake up to the fact, right, that this is not a targeted, limited security operation, that this is something much larger scale, and that it was, um, and that it was a profound and evil mistake. Um, Putin's last, uh, one of the last addresses to the Russian people was about the empire of lies, right, the West is the empire of lies. And I think um, a lot of people are susceptible to that narrative within Russia right now. But I, I agree with Tina that I think what needs to motivate people to take these risks, which are highly risky in this repressive regime, is, is the promise of something better for themselves in the future. There is, there is a, a question from Jonathan Chan in Hong Kong. Uh, it's a question, it's a comment. Uh, listening to how Ukraine is sort of caught between two entities, quotation marks, the West and Russia, and not really allowed their own space for self-definition in a sense reminds me of how Hong Kong is kind of in a similar spot, a liminal post-coloniality as uh, Ray Chow said in 98. Where similarly Hong Kong cannot find the space to find its own identity, I'm wondering if perhaps post-coloniality -colon theory can provide an analytical framework for looking at Ukraine's history of the past few decades. We have been very much inspired by the Ukrainian spirit displayed in the uh, Euromaidan protests in the past and are so inspired by the strength of the Ukrainian people in this time. I wish them all the best and we are cheering for you all, even though we may not be too public in doing so under our circumstances. 
Does anybody want to comment on that? There is a question, but there's the question is uh, is about postcoloniality theory. I'm just going to point out that there is a history of debate about whether Ukraine is postcolonial or not. And um, I might point you first to an article by a historian whose name is um, uh, Yaroslav Hritsak, whose uh, piece is called The Postcolonial is Not Enough. And it really picks through the reasons why the kind of subaltern school, the Indian subcontinental school of subaltern theory doesn't necessarily, again, doesn't necessarily provide the perfect analogy to the Ukrainian case. I, I can write that into the chat, but there's a lot written about this. And I myself have tried to use both postcolonial and decolonial theory to talk about Ukraine as have a lot of the amazing decolonial feminists um, who, uh, have been working on similar things. And I'll drop a link also to a journal called Kritika Feministichna, which has uh, also advanced a lot of that work. Um, and they have, they publish in English and in Ukrainian and in Russian. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, yeah, Anna, Anna was just complimenting what she said before. And she's saying it is very dangerous to protest nowadays. A bill was submitted to the Russian parliament on conscription to military service in Donbass region for those who are persecuted for participating in illegal actions against the Russian special operation. Um, I, I, I think I, I didn't mention it in the beginning, but this um, webinar is being uh, recorded and it will be on the WOW website so that if anyone afterwards want to, wants to listen to it. Now, do we have any more questions or? If we do, Clara, there is okay. a question from Emilia Zabilute. Is it, it's on, the, it's on the question and answer, isn't it? Question and answer, yeah. Yeah, okay, so I'm jumping from one to the other because right. I was on Bat Papu. <laughs> okay, so yes, uh, Emilia has a question for Maria. I'm glad you brought up the decolonial, decolonial movement in academia because that is also very present in the UK academy, academia. I feel the events in Ukraine opened up possibilities for Eastern Europeans and scholars of Eastern Europe to participate in the debates and the politics of it. What do you think Eastern Europe scholars can learn from it and how they can contribute to it? Uh, just so I make sure that I understand the question, what can they learn from the decolonial critique? Or what can they learn from what? Yes, Amelia says yes. Um, yeah, well, I th from the Ukrainian decolonial critique, um, I, th I think from the Ukrainian decolonial critique, what we can really learn about is the ways in which, um, well, so there are two things, I guess. One is the ways in which there's a decolonial critique that's also intersectional that should interest people in the North American Academy. So I just dropped the link to the Kritika Feministichna. This is one example, right, of this. The second is that this question of whether or not Ukraine exactly comports to the model of the post-colony um, is an interesting academic exercise. But I think as an ethnographer, one of the really poignant elements of so many of the testimonies um, that I've gathered over the years, and particularly right now as I'm working on a book about late Soviet Kyiv and its musical uh, rock culture, um, rock music culture, is the ways in which it can take time to recognize oneself as a colonized subject, right? So um, many decolonial writings from the 19th 60s and 70s, um, and I'm thinking, I, I've just been reading Albert Memmi, the Tunisian uh, intellectual's uh, kind of personal statement about this, is that this is a process. Decoloniality takes time sometimes, right? Um, the kind of dynamics of colonization um, inculcate people into ways of being that can take time to unlearn. So I'm inspired by some of the decolonial work that's being done across different regions. And I will just throw out one more endorsement, which is um, Ladina Tolstanova has collaborated with um, Walter Mignolo to kind of do a comparative study of decolonial options in very different parts of the world. Tolstanova works primarily, I think, in Central Asia and Mignolo works in the Americas. And um, it's inspiring work to kind of think, think across these di radically different experiences of colonization um, to come up with, um, with useful 
frameworks that we can then apply to very localized circumstances. And the Ukrainian case poses an extremely complex one, both because of its multiple imperial inheritances. It's not just a story of Russian imperialism. Um, and also because of its relationship to the Soviet Union, which wasn't exactly a classic kind of em imperial formation. I will simply say that we're always um, we're witnessing neo-feudalism because Putin in the last 20 years has made it such that nobody can replace him. You know, and it was a step-like fashion. So for example, many years ago, and since he replaced the, the elected presidents of the governors of the, you know, the component parts of the Russian by being people who were, who were appointed by him. So in other words, in a sense, you have a system where everybody who has any way of actually influencing the power are all directly tied to Putin and can be replaced at any time. So you have a very hierarchical structure where Putin is the one that ultimately has all, all the power. And in Chechnya, they solved it basically having Kadyrov and with his, I guess, his men, and I'll use men because it tend to be very, of course, very patriarchal and very, where and anybody who opposes Kadyrov is killed by, in a sense, by the forces and Kadyrov basically gets to do what he wants just as long as he pledges absolute loyalty to Putin. And we see a similar process now, I guess, in, I guess, uh, in Belarus. So, and where you have, in a sense, this this logic where we're almost, I guess we have, I guess we have yet to almost beyond the the old Russian Empire of the nineteenth century model to, I guess, in the I guess in the twenty first century. Okay, it's nine. It's almost nine thirty here, so probably ten thirty for Maria, and she's going to have to go. But I, I still see a couple of questions or comments in the chat, so I want to read Chris Kirsten Kolsch's. Drawing attention to people, do you think it would be pertinent inquiring more about what happened with all those 363 million citizens of ex socialist countries by 1988? Social actors who experienced since 1989 the decline of working class culture, disorientation, economic hardship, and often misunderstanding of our embodied being in today's world. I am one of those born during Cold War in Karl Marx's stadt. Due to all, do all the before mentioned. I studied anthropology at the age of thirty-eight. Any comments? What happened to the three hundred sixty-three million social actors who experienced the decline of the working class culture, disorientation, economic hardship, and so forth? But were we were talking about Russia, three hundred sixty-three million. So no. 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 Russia has roughly now one hundred forty million, give or take. Right, I know. So. So, so that's the, the entire population of what used to be the, the Soviet, Soviet Union. Union. Yeah, the Soviet Union. Do you want to say anything, anybody? Well, I think and this is where, in a sense, coming back to Tina, the, the need to do the local. I think what is was happening in Ukraine was quite different. What was happening in Kazakhstan, which is quite different. What's happening, I guess, in the Baltic states and I guess in Latvia, Estonia, I guess, in Lithuania. So we have, in a sense, we have to do the, the classic anthropological thing. We have to study the local to then understand how it fits into the global, whether it's the global post-communist post or global in terms of the, the world global. Actually, I didn't get Kirstin's question. Uh, is it a question? So, uh, but uh, I wanted to say something similar, similar to uh, Michelle, because uh, there are so many questions about imperialism, colonialism, uh, different theories, capitalism. But um, as anthropologists, we have to start not from the theory, but from the fieldwork, and uh, we can do this fieldwork. Um, before the war ends. And uh, it is a little bit dangerous to use all these theories before the field work. So I just asked not to do uh, some conclusions before you talk to people here. Okay. Clara, I, I see something from Tatiana Poliu Excova. Uh, wait, I think is that because I was trying to find new questions, but the the last one I have is from nine, nine Amelia, which I, which I read already. No, 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 it's in the chat. That's yeah, it. I'm in the chat. I'm in the chat, but I see no is other Russian people today are hostage of the situation. Oh, yeah. I read that already. Uh, I did. I, 
did I not read it already? Yeah, the Russian, oh, perhaps not, Tatiana, the Russian people today are in a hostage situation. Opening your mouth, expressing your point of view, even in the circle of close friends, you do not know what point of view and in what form, how rude you will hear from the other side and it's scary and it hurts. Smart people nearby adhere to the position of the validity of the invasion of Ukraine because people were killed in the Donbass and the Russians are the saviors. The war is called a peacemaking operation. Teachers at the university are punish, punished for expressing their opinions on the networks. People write classic denunciation of 1937 against each other and many do not support Putin. Ask one question, will it be possible to immigrate from the country? So this is uh, Tatiana's uh, comment. It's not so much a question, it's a comment. Um, but I could turn it, wait, I could turn it into a question and that has to do with the last thing about emigrating, emigrating from Russia, emigrating from Ukraine. Well, I, think, I think the question was about Russia and, but- uh, well, I know, but, but what do you think, Tina, about emigrating from Ukraine? I mean, are the, are the borders going to be closed? Uh, about emigrating from Ukraine to European Union or what are you talking about? Anywhere, anywhere. Uh, I don't want to emigrate, I stayed here. Um, and uh, I think I have the right not to feel empathy to Russians right now. So when I hear all this information about that Russian people are scary and it is hard to uh, talk about uh, what do you think in this country. So it is your country. It is your choice to fight for your freedom. And if you want to um, represent your opinion, you have to fight for that uh, in your country, inside. And um, so this is all I can say about it. And I will say it says right now, the last number of 500,000 refugees is from Ukraine and they're expecting maybe millions. I think there will be, this will create repercussions in Poland, Hungary, I guess, and all the neighboring countries and across Europe, so. The last I heard, uh, uh, Michelle, was about a million. Michel Bukowski, okay. Do you want to, have you noticed that there is much more talk about Russia than about Ukraine? Who are you asking, Michelle, both of them? He's probably asking everyone. <laughs> <laughs> he probably is. I did note a bit too. <laughs> Just a remark, okay. Yeah, yeah. And Muggs is saying he's noticed that too. Yeah. Okay, so I don't want if I don't know if anyone has more comments and or questions or if we should call it uh, because we've been here. Uh, it's almost twenty to four. Well, in Portugal, <laughs> and in Ukraine, it's two hours later, I think, and. Uh, yeah, well, I, th I think this was a very good debate and uh, to at least address this terrible question and what's happening in the world today. I don't know if you guys have any more comments. Maybe Tina, do you want to uh, say a few words, I guess, to end? Uh, maybe I will end with a little story. So um, we created our Center for Pro-Polite Anthropology, like non-government organization, to make something anthropological here without in any institutions. Yes, to, to make uh, academic workshops, to make applied research and so on. And I will tell you about six people from this organization uh, who lived in Kyiv and are not, uh, some of them are not in Kyiv right now. So maybe uh, after the war, some of you uh, will have um, uh, an opportunity to collaborate or something else, or maybe we will arrange something in Kyiv and we could um, uh, we could tell you to come here when it, it will be safe here. So um, uh, one of the members of our organization, Yulia Buskich, is the specialist in anthropology of religion. She's now in Kyiv with her mom and her cat, and she's hiding in shelters. So she wanted to come, but she couldn't. Uh, the other member of our center is Svetlana Makhovska. She and her two little babies are out of Kyiv right now in the village. And she is a specialist in traditional Ukrainian wedding and traditional Ukrainian culture. Uh, the other um, member of our um, center is Oksana Ovsiuk. Uh, her uh, PhD was about everyday life in Kyiv in 1943-1945. It is a little bit 
ironical right now. So, and she's trying uh, to get from Kievska Oblast right now with another our colleague, Olena Sobolova, who is uh, the main specialist in Crimean Tatar traditional culture. And she and her husband and little babies are trying yes, to, to get to Western Ukraine right now. And uh, when you are talking about all these theories and all these complex global um, issues. Just don't forget about small people who live here and who try to do something here, anthropological and not anthropological. And this is what I ask for. Clara, wait, uh, just just before we end then, Mary Helen had something to, to say a couple of times, but that has to do with what we outside Ukraine can do. Uh, I know that Maria addressed this, but Mary wants more. So first of all, you can help our army and there are a lot of um, information about that. And a lot of uh, volunteers, they work with people uh, in the USA and in Europe and they try to help with uh, uh, with different things, yes, yeah? so for army and for people, and uh, of course there are a lot of refugees appear, and you, you could help them also. Uh, maybe if you want, you could add me on Facebook, and I will share information with you. Okay. All right, and thank you everybody for your support to Ukraine. Well, thank you to everyone who is here today, especially to Tina, who is uh, addressing us straight from Russia. I'm sorry, from Ukraine. Whoa, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. But uh, so thank you to everyone and to Michelle, who put up this, this webinar and uh, contacted the people. And uh, we hope we'll be able to talk next time in better times. Uh, and let's hope the war ends quickly. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank again, you. thank you, Tina. I guess and our hearts are with you in a sense, I guess, and, and may may this end very soon. So thank yeah. everybody. Let's thank hope. you. Thank, thank you, you, Tina. Bye guys. Uh, bye. Take care.